supposedly streaming. Yeah, I saw that. Look at that. <laughs> so cool. Hello, internet. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Let me uh, mute it so I don't get um, feedback because that is annoying. Cool. All right, and I'll hit record and um, I'm going to get started with a couple of slides here and then uh, we'll get started. So. Awesome. Say, so, uh, welcome to the um, June edition of the uh, Utah Data Engineering Meetup. I'm Joe Reese, uh, one of the uh, co-organizers of uh, the Utah Data Engineering Meetup. And um, actually, for some context, this is our second anniversary. We turned two uh, today. So that's pretty cool. I think this started out as uh, um, sort of a... Uh, a way to get data engineers and uh, data literate people together. And so far we've done a really good job. Um, tonight we have uh, Dave Langer. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, he's gonna be talking about a, a guide to hands-on data literacy. Uh, this is gonna um, encompass quite a few uh, areas and I'm really excited to uh, see what he has to say. Uh, found Dave on LinkedIn, as I'm sure a lot of you have. He's uh, a notorious, um, data heretic, much like myself. Uh, we um, hit it off immediately uh, and really excited to have him on. Uh, he, he, in a lot of ways, seems like my uh, lost, uh, long lost twin brother. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things. We have uh, some upcoming talks um, next week. We are on a different group called the Data Nerd Herd. That is uh, just like a Friday discussion informal about a topic. We have Jeff Baird from uh, doTERRA. He's talking about gut-driven data decisions. That's going to be really cool. Um, chat with me if you want uh, an invite to that. It's kind of a tight-knit group. Um, and then on July 15th, uh, Utah Data Engineering Meetup, we got Five Tran in the house talking about the modern data stack. So they're going to go over things like ELT, and um, just more modern practices to uh, data. So that is gonna be well worth checking out. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dave and let him get set up. So. Okay. Let me know if you can see the title slide. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending this evening. Uh, my name is Dave Langer, as Eric, uh, Joe mentioned, and I'm going to be presenting a guide to hands-on data literacy. So, but a bit about me first. Why are, you, why are you here? Why are you listening to me? Why do you care about what I have anything, about anything I have to say? And the reason for that is multifaceted. One, I've been in tech and analytics for a long time, more than 20 years. Uh, believe it or not, I got my start writing COBOL on a mainframe, so don't hold that against me, please. Right now, I'm currently employed as the VP of Analytics at a company called Schedulicity, which is based in beautiful Bozeman, Montana. And before that, I worked at a company called Data Science Dojo, where I traveled around the United States and Canada and taught working professionals the foundations of data science in a week-long intensive boot camp format. And before that, I spent a number of years at the Evil Empire as a senior Director of BI and Analytics in Microsoft's manufacturing and supply chain organization. I'm also the Dave behind DaveOnData.com. And as Joe mentioned, I am a, I'm a spammer basically on YouTube and on LinkedIn. But probably most importantly, the reason why you care is because I got a soft heart, because I am the human to Zoe the Dobie, the world's worst Doberman pincher in the whole history of humanity. <laughs> She's my, she's my light, and she's my light. And you can see her right now um, in that photograph here in Montana on a hike. Okay, so hopefully that qualifies me to be talking tonight in your mind. I wanna talk about data literacy, and this is something I'm passionate about. It's my mission in 2020. And I have a very specific philosophy around data literacy. One, it has to be practical, and two, it needs to be hands-on. Those two things, if you don't have those two things, I, I don't want to, I, I don't really care about, I don't really have any idea of what you're saying. If, if, you're, if you talk about data literacy, you have to have those two things. So 
there's only two things that I think of when I think about data literacy, right? If somebody comes to me and says, Dave, I want to get literate with data. I want to build some data analysis techniques. There are only two things I'm going to ask them. One, do you have Excel skills? And two, do you have the motivation to put the time in to learn the things that you need to learn? That's it. That's all you need. And I will show you throughout the rest of this presentation exactly what I mean by that. Now, you'll notice that everything is color-coded green in this deck, and that is because Excel's branding color is green. That's to reinforce the idea that everything you see in this deck, you can do in Excel. That's all you need. Okay, so I have a data literacy roadmap here, and it comes in three stages. This is the first stage, which I call the user, right? Are you sufficiently educated in data to use it properly, use it efficiently, use it effectively? And how I term this level of user data literacy is business analysis. Now, hold on, don't freak out, right? Business analysis means lots of things to lots of different people. In my mind, I have a very specific meaning when I use the term business analysis, and I have very specific learning objectives. And you can see those down here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my laser pointer here. You can see these down here in particular. So the first thing that I think about when I think about business analysis is process centricity. And in the United States, that's kind of got a, um, it's kind of a, got a bad rap, right? If you talk about business processes, a lot of people's eyes just glaze over and they're like, oh my God, what are you talking about? But it's really important because here's the fundamental idea I would argue. Every organization is nothing more than its totality of its executing business processes, whether they're documented or not. And most importantly, whether management actually understands what goes on day to day or not. There are business processes, okay? That's, this is how that work. So when you take that view, things become a lot easier when you start talking about how do I analyze data and how do I analyze it effectively? So in this, in this grouping of business analysis, there's a couple of other things, right? Once you understand process centricity, you have to understand that business processes vary. That's a fundamental idea. No human being wakes up and executes a business process perfectly every single time, every single day, week in and week out. It doesn't happen. Those of us that work in IT and technology, even if you automate a business process, there's these things called bugs, which means that even automated processes vary over time because you've introduced a bug and something breaks. It happens all the time. So in business analysis, you understand first and foremost that there is business processes and that they vary over time. And then you say, okay, cool. The first thing I need to understand then is how do I understand whether this variation in the business process is something that's normal because it's expected to fluctuate and move around and about. And when is it actually something I need to pay attention to? So with some basic numeric literacy and some data visualization skills, you're ready to learn the mighty process behavior chart. Now the, pro the process behavior chart is mighty and you'll see why in the next couple of slides because it allows you to take a look at your business, a business process measure. Maybe it's sales or expenses or conversion rate on your e-commerce site, whatever it is. You can look at these things in the context over time and say, okay, is the variation that I'm seeing normal and expected or is there something bad happening or something good happening that I should be paying attention to? Right, process behavior charts help you with this. They come from the realm of manufacturing originally, but they are wildly useful for all kinds of business data. And lastly, one of the most important things that you learn at this stage of data literacy is how to compare groups. Now, all of us are familiar conceptually with the scientific method, like for example, drug trials. Let's say you invented a new drug that um, lowers cholesterol, let's say, and you wanna see if it actually works. You have a control group that gets a sugar pill, a placebo, and then you have a treatment group that actually gets the pill. And then you take the average uh, of, the, of the cholesterol of each of those groups. And if hopefully it looks like this, if you're the drug company, right? This is the treatment group. And on average, their cholesterol is lower now. And you can say, hey, I've controlled for everything. So now there is a difference. So the drug works. Now, the problem is in business, you usually don't have the ability to do truly randomized experiments. Maybe you do some A-B testing. That's one exception. But generally speaking, it doesn't happen in the business. But you still want to compare groups. And I'll go in more detail about how powerful this is in Two slides. Okay. At the next stage, this is what I call the power user, right? So 
You can stop anywhere you want, by the way. This is very much a choose your own adventure roadmap. You can either stop at the user level or the power user level or at the third level, which I'll get to in a second. So you don't have to do all of it. You can pick and choose what you want. Or maybe you start with one level and you get to that and you do it for a while. And then later on, you move on to another level. Totally up to you. This is a practical way to gain data literacy and data analysis skills. So at the power user level, we add linear regression. Okay, I was waiting for people to faint. Don't, don't, don't freak out. Don't, don't freak out. Linear regression is a wildly useful tool. And think of it this way. While you might need to know a lot of mathematics to use linear regression in the most optimal way possible, there are plenty of people in the world that use linear regression every day that don't necessarily have advanced mathematical training. For example, sociologists and psychologists and other types of folks that work in the social sciences. They use linear regression, but they don't necessarily have advanced mathematics. You can do the same thing. You can use Excel to handle all the complicated math for you, and you just concentrate on the concepts, and then you apply it to your business data. It's wildly, wildly useful stuff, and it's approachable by anybody, and I mean anybody who's motivated to learn it. So if you're not familiar with linear regression, linear regression is used to predict quantities. It's basically a number with a decimal point in it weight and height and sales and expenses, anything that you can think of with a decimal point that's a number, that's what you're gonna use linear regression for. You're gonna use that to try and predict that quantity. And you can learn things like simple linear regression where you use one piece of data to predict another piece of data, or you can learn multiple linear regression where you can use many pieces of data to try and predict one piece of data. And what you can learn is at, the, at this level of data literacy is how you can use linear regression to model the business. And then also how to evaluate whether your model is any good. Because generally speaking, if you go through the effort to model your business, you wanna be able to hang your hat on the results. So you can learn all of that. And all you need is Excel. That's all you need. Now at the third stage, the last stage is what I'm calling the citizen business analyst. And the reason why I'm calling it the citizen business analyst is because in a lot of organizations, especially larger companies, business and a business analyst has a title, a formal role in HR with educational requirements and job descriptions and all these kinds of things. But you can think about it this way. Um, let's say you work in the logistics area of your supply chain organization. You might want to gain data analysis skills to do your job better but you have no desire to be a quote unquote formal business analyst from a job title perspective. So that's where this idea of the citizen business analyst comes from. Okay, what we add at this level are two distinct areas of knowledge. One is data visualization. Now, of course, all the things that you would normally expect in Excel are included in here, you know, pivot tables and pivot charts and all those sorts of things, but also some additional data visualizations that aren't usually quite that aren't usually seen commonly in Excel fall into this bucket of data literacy. So for example, uh, visualizations for distributions by categories. Now this is what is known as a box and whisker plot. It's a wildly useful tool. It's not something you see a lot in Excel. And at this level of data literacy, you start to learn some of these more advanced data visualization techniques, mainly because they are useful in using modeling techniques like linear regression and what I'll talk about here in a second, logistic regression. So the data visualization is more than just for like dashboards. It's really for you to understand the nature of your data from a predictive perspective. That's what a lot of this is talking about. And then lastly, we have logistic regression. Okay, so the easiest way to think about logistic regression is in comparison to linear regression. So linear regression, you're predicting quantities, numbers, right? 37.5 or 44.4, whatever it might be. Logistic regression is different. Logistic regression, you're trying to predict essentially a binary, a yes, no kind of situation, right? Is this a good credit risk, yay or nay? Is this a legitimate credit card transaction, yay or nay? Logistic regression works with binary, binary outcomes. So you're predicting categories essentially, yes or no, legit or fraudulent, approve or deny. And then to use logistic regression effectively, you, you don't have to learn a ton. You have to learn a, learn a few mathematical things, but trust me, they are not that difficult. You need to understand a little bit about probability, nothing, nothing untoward, nothing really scary, and a little bit about odds ratios. If you've ever been to like a horse racetrack, you're 
familiar with this, right? So if you've ever been on the ponies, you know what I'm talking about. So this is eminently approachable by anybody. Now, here's the thing. Linear regression comes out of the box in Excel. I'll talk a little bit more about this in the later slide. Logistic regression does not. You have to actually do it yourself using a part of Excel known as the solver. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. All you need to know is that it's relatively easy. Later on in the deck, I will show you a template of what it looks like to use to do this in Excel. Once you learn the template, once you learn the concepts, it's easy to plug and chug, copy and paste, and you're off and running and modeling and logistic regression. It's not that difficult. And as with linear regression, you're going to learn to model the business and interpret the models. And then you're also going to be able to evaluate the models to see if they're any good. Now, throughout the rest of the deck, I'm going to go through each one of these stages one at a time. And we're going to talk a little bit about each, show you examples of what it looks like in Excel, and more importantly, show you the kinds of business questions that you can answer at each stage of data literacy using a hypothetical example of a call center manager. Now, before I move on, though, I think I'm going to pause and see if Joe's got any questions. I'll uh, open up to the audience. Uh, anyone have any questions so far? I know I have a couple, but... They did ask if the slides are going to be available uh, after the talk. So I yeah, sure. Yeah, spoke totally. I told them I posted to meet up. So um, I, I actually I do have a question on the uh, uh, business analysis uh, portion here. Like, okay, you know, it's it's the early stage, but what sort of a math background do you think a person should have to be um, effective at, at that area? Uh, for this one in particular, um, yeah. can you can you add and subtract? Okay. <laughs> I mean, so, not, so nothing too fancy. Nothing too fancy. Like, so the numeric literacy aspect would be like, um, what's an average, right? Versus the, the math, the, you know, the arithmetic mean versus the median, which are extremely simple concepts. They're not difficult at all. That's basically all you need. As I, I'll go through another slide, there are some calculations that the process behavior charts um, use. However, you don't need to understand the underlying theory that got to the calculations to use them effectively. That's one of the powers of them. If you want to go research that and learn it yourself, you, you can, but you don't have to. Awesome, cool, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Okay, cool, moving on. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about a little bit about business analysis, right? I'm gonna go through some examples of the kinds of things I'm talking about in Excel. Okay, so here is a mighty process behavior chart. And you can see here that this is a chart for the quarterly sales of some company. We'll call it Widget Co for lack of a better way of, lack of, for lack of a better name. and what you'll see here is what is known as a running record, oftentimes called a line chart as well, where each data point essentially is the quarterly sales figure for Widget Co. from the first quarter of 2017 through the end of 2018. Okay. And if you ignore these gray lines for a second, you've probably seen this a million times, either in Tableau or Power BI or your dashboarding tool of choice, or maybe even in Excel itself. These are very common, right? What this shows is a business process measure, in this case, quarterly sales, recorded over time. Now, not surprisingly, quarterly sales varies, okay? That's what happens. Like any business process, it varies over time. That's just a natural state. The question really is, for example, is this dip significant? Is this something that the CFO should be extremely concerned about? And the process behavior chart helps you answer that kind of question. Okay, so let's talk about how it does that. So first and foremost, you'll notice that this gray line in the middle is just the average of the data. Right? So you take all these data points, add them up, divide by eight, and that gives you this number, which is around a little over 4.2 million. Now, the reason why the average is important is because it is a predictive model. The average, the mean, is the most common predictive model in the world, by the way. So that's something you will learn when you, when you, if you study linear, re linear regression. You're trying to build a linear regression model that's better than the mean. That's one of the things that you're trying to do because the mean is like the best predictive model in the, that you can use if you know nothing else. It's so like, for example, if you knew nothing about what the company's strategy was going to be for Q1 2019 in terms of sales, maybe new products or marketing, if you didn't know anything about that and your boss said, Dave, what are you predicting our sales are going to be for first quarter of next year? I would just pick the average. It's probably the best thing I can do. It's the most educated guess that I can make if I don't know anything else. So the average is important. So it's placed on the line here for that reason. Or it's placed on the chart, excuse me, for that reason. Now, then you'll notice 
that there's these two gray lines up here and down here. These are numbers, these are lines, these are values that are statistically calculated from the data, from the data. And as I said earlier to Joe, you don't need to have a strong math background. You don't have to understand how the calculations came to be. You just need to use them and understand what they mean. Focus on the concepts, not necessarily the mathematics. You can always learn that if you'd like, but you don't have to. And what these do is these provide boundaries. These are like guardrails. What this says is, look, based on the historical performance of this business process, in this case, eight quarters of sales data, based on that, it is statistically unlikely that you would ever see a value all the way up here or a value all the way down here. These are your data guardrails. If you, if you see something like that happen, like if let's say quarter, first quarter 2019, the sales are way down here, you should be freaking out, right? This is so unlikely to happen that you should be paying attention to it. And for example, maybe the, there's a, an economic collapse or the company had a, a massive lawsuit or you know who knows, right? There's some sort of thing that could happen, an external shock to this business process that would cause it to drop. If you see a data point down here or a data point up here, it's telling you that something fundamentally different is happening in the business and you should investigate. Now, these two lines, right? I'm sorry, Dave, got one question here um, related to the graph, and then there's actually a separate question related to something you said earlier. Uh, okay. So um, why well, ask for the uh, upper and lower limits? What's a good way to explain the statistical significance to management? Right. Okay, so the statistical significance to management is basically is to say, the way I, the way I typically phrase it myself, because it, using the term statistical, statistical significance, excuse me, is a good way to lose half of your audience every time you say it. So like you get like this exponential decline. So try not to use that terminology. I've learned that the hard way. What you wanna say is unlikely, improbable. What I typically refer to these two, and this is a blatant ripoff of the movie Top Gun, is I typically refer to these as the danger zones. Because if you see something here, this is the danger zone. Now, depending on the metric in question, it could be bad if it's down here and good up here or reversed. So for example, if the process measure is churn rate, for example, you want your churn rate to be low. You don't want it to be high. So regardless, these tend to be the danger zones. And that's usually the terminology that I use to explain the significance, right? It's so unlikely that if you see a data point in this part of the chart, you're in the danger zone and we should definitely be doing something about it. We should be taking a look at it and see what's going on. Thanks. Uh, the, the other question is um, from uh, Shub H. Uh, Shub. Um, data literacy means understanding of regression, question mark, and why linear is preceded by logistic, question mark. Ah, so here's what you have to do. You have to understand, right? This is, this is one person's opinion about data literacy, right? And this is based on my experience working in many types of environments that what are essentially the main techniques, the main concepts, the main tools that I wish that every professional, and most importantly, by the way, every manager had to be making data-driven decisions. Now, linear regression before logistic regression, it's usually, the reason why I put it in that particular um, sequence is because linear regression is out of the box with Excel. Um, using something called the analysis tool pack. You just enable that add-in in Excel and you get a, basically a, a UX interface, a clickable interface to do a linear regression. It's a little bit easier. Now, I'm not trying to say that linear regression is more important necessarily than logistic regression. There, you could make an argument that they're equally important. However, for, in terms of a progression of skills, it, seems, it seemed to me that it makes more sense for people to tackle the important stuff that is easier to do in Excel first for no other reason, because it'll help them build confidence in their skills. And then subsequently, they, they'll learn the other stuff. They'll have the confidence to learn the other stuff. Cool, thanks. I think that's all uh, for now, so continue. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so we've got the chart here. We've got, the, we've got our guardrails, right, for the danger zone. And I will not sing Kenny Loggins for you guys. I will spare you that. So you got the danger zone here, right, and down here. And then you have these two lines right here. These are typically what I refer to as the happy path corridor, because generally speaking, if you have a process that's relatively stable, let's say you are 
Um, Widgetco is a very stable company. They've been in business for a long time. They're not necessarily introducing a lot of products very rapidly. They're not necessarily experiencing a lot of economic impacts. You would kind of expect that their sales, all things being equal, would kind of oscillate between these two lines. And in fact, generally speaking, what you'll see is if you have a mature, stable kind of thing that you're measuring, about 80% of the time, all the data points are going to fall between these two lines. And this is your happy path corridor. Now, here's the thing. When I tell folks this, when I tell business folks this, they typically don't like it. They don't like it because what I'm telling them is essentially is that generally speaking, I can accurately predict 80% of the time, the range of what your business process value is going to be. For example, for Widgetco in first quarter of 2019, Dave, what do you think the sales are going to be? Well, if I don't know any better, I'll predict around 4.2 million because that's the average, the historical average. All things being equal, that's not a bad educated guess. A more accurate prediction would be to use this range to say it's between, oh, I don't know, maybe 3.9 million and let's say 4.9 million. I would be right based on the historical data, assuming that nothing changed fundamentally in the business, I'd be right 80% of the time, more than likely. So this is really powerful stuff. Not only does it allow you to analyze data, but it also allows you to get some sort of understanding of the prediction of the future based on the historical data without doing anything fancy like linear regression, for example. Okay, so this is powerful stuff, right? Just think about this. This can be any metric, any KPI, any OKR, whatever you call them, on any of your dashboards, anything that your business cares about you can create these process behavior charts and start to look at them from a statistical lens to see what is the variation? What is the expected variation? Are we above? Are we below? Have we shifted things? And we'll talk about this in a second. Have we Dave. actually implemented a change? Yeah. So we got a question from Pedro. He's asking why 80%? Ah, why 80%? That um, without going into too much detail, the, the way these were calculated specifically by the gentleman who created them, a gentleman by the name of Schuert, back in the 1920s. He actually designed them specifically so the calculations typically, prototypically include 80% of the data points if your process is quote unquote stable. It's just how the math works out. But just make sure I didn't pick that number, just so we're clear. <laughs> I didn't pick that number. Okay, cool. So this is good stuff. But where the real power comes in is on this next slide. Okay, so let's just talk about this for a second. So the black line is the conversion rate. And let's say, for example, this is the Widgetco's e-commerce site. And what they do is they track what is the average conversion rate or what is the conversion rate per month for the e-commerce site. And we can, let's say it's paid conversion, right? How many people who come into the website actually end up buying something month to month? Now, you'll notice here that what I've got is two years worth of data. Right? I got 12 data points for 2017 and 12 data points for 2018. And what I've done is I've said, look, even though this is the same business process, the same business process measure, that is the conversion rate for Widgetco's e-commerce site, I've actually said, look, I will artificially split them into two groups based on time. The 2017 group and the 2018 group. Now, here's the thing. Imagine, if you will, hypothetically speaking, that a new director of e-commerce took over in the beginning of 2018. And this director said, you know what? I'm going to implement some changes. I'm going to improve things. And at the end of 2018, she's saying to her boss, hey, man, I improve things. It's bonus time. It's cash money time. You can use these charts to actually verify that claim in a very objective and standardized way. So what you can do is you can say, are these groups actually different? If the director is claiming, look, my team under my direction implemented changes in 2018 that improved things, what they're saying is these data points are fundamentally different than these data points. This is the old version of the e-commerce site and this is the new version of the e-commerce site. Now, and here's the kicker. Notice that I, there's no A-B test here. There's no randomized experiment. You can do these types of analyses even if you don't have an A-B test. And most of the time in business, that is typically the case. You don't have a randomized experiment to work with. Something, somebody changed something and they're claiming, hey, I changed that and it worked. You can use this technique to validate or to investigate whether or not that claim has any validity. 
And here's how you do it. The first group, you calculate the guardrails. You can see that here, right? So here's the group one upper limit. If nothing changed between 2017 and, 2007 and 2018, right? If nothing changed, right? If the claim that the director is making is false, nothing had changed, then you should see no value above this. But you'll notice this green dot right here, this green dot. This is interesting because if we draw, if we use our mind's eye and we draw a little line going over to the other side of the chart, and I'll just fill this in for you, you can see that it's above the guardrail for 2017. And what this tells you is these are actually different. The director's claim has some merit because the idea is if nothing changed, you shouldn't see this dot. Everything should be within 2017's guardrails because if nothing changed, then 2017 should look like 2018, basically. You can use these things to compare groups. And notice that I'm using a single business process measure here divided by time. That's a very common use case, but you don't have to do that. You can use this technique, for example, to compare org A to org B. Let's say you work in HR and you're interested in comparing bad attrition, right? People leaving the company that typically have really good performance reviews. And you can think to yourself, hey, I think org B has worse attrition their management is doing something wrong. What you can do is you can use a process behavior chart just like this and compare group A being org, you know, org A, group one, and org B, group two. And you can compare their bad attrition rates and you can say, are they actually different? Statistically, are they actually different without running an, uh, a randomized experiment? This is wildly powerful stuff. And as I said earlier, when Joe asked, you don't need that much math. You don't need that much math at all because all of this stuff has already been figured out for you. You just understand the concepts and how to apply them, and you're good to go. So we got a question here from a um, way. Uh, what's a good way to tell if a process is stable or not? Ah, yeah. So can't go into that. Don't have time. There, it's a very good question. At the very end of the deck, I am going to go through some low cost resources that you can purchase and study on this. Study this stuff. Um, study this. The, study this for yourself. And the book talks all about that. So there are very precise um, steps for determining exactly that. Okay, moving on. So that's business analysis. Okay, as promised, here's the hypothetical. Let's say for the sake of argument that you are the manager of the call center for Widgetco and you've decided that you wanna be the most awesome call center manager in the history of Widget Co. So you're gonna get some data literacy, you're gonna get some data analysis skills so that you can optimize operations in the call center. So what are some of the things that you can do in, um, in, that, in that particular pursuit at the business analysis level at that first tier? So notice that these are all essentially group comparison questions. Both of these are group comparison question. So for example, has there actually been a change in call volumes sufficient to affect staffing levels, right? Um, one of my very first jobs out of college, I worked in a call center. So this one is near and dear to my heart, which is sometimes the queue is just like swamp with people. So you, you wanna have the, the right number of agents on the floor so people don't wait too long, right? Because they get very surly and they're very unhappy and they might churn, they might go to one of your competitors. So this is extremely important. Now, the great thing is if at this level of data literacy, you can say, for example, and I'll make this up on the spot, uh, what were the monthly call volumes for 2017? And what are the monthly call volumes for 2018? And you can use what we just saw in the process behavior chart to compare these two groups. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. This is the most awesome part. If you use this level of data literacy and your manager, you know, the call center director, let's say, is also educated in data literacy, they can't argue with you because they know that you've used a standardized objective process. Doesn't mean you're gonna get the money, doesn't mean you're necessarily gonna get the headcount, but they can't sit there and say, you cook the books, because you can show them, look, this is the data, this is the standardized technique, 2018 is, the volumes are higher, they just are. Ergo, we either need more staff or we need to, re, you know, we might have to suffer the consequences of potentially lower customer satisfaction, longer wait times on the phone. There's also, the second question is also related as well. So let's say, for example, um, 
the Widgetco call center runs two shifts. They run a morning shift and a second shift. And the lead of the second shift is claiming because of their leadership that the second shift is more efficient at handling calls, right? A classic example you might make during your annual review to, <laughs> to, to justify why you might get a bigger raise or a bonus or something like that. Once again, you can use the process behavior charts to examine the first shift versus the second shift and see if they're actually true. Is it actually true that the second shift is more efficient at handling calls? Now, here's the kicker. This is the great part. If the lead is actually educated on data literacy at all, you might not ever have this conversation because the lead could actually look at the data themselves and say, is this true or not? And if it is, of course, they're gonna trumpet themselves and they'll be have a nice standardized objective way to say, look, I am awesome. It's time for me to get a bonus. Okay. Got one question here. Sure. Um, how does a person become better, uh, a better storyteller, uh, especially with explaining technical terms to management? Oh, that's that's a tough one. Um, the answer is there's there's in my experience, anyway, take this for what it's worth. There is no simple one way of doing that. Um, to be honest with you, I will confess, I'm still on a journey for data storytelling myself. Um, if you follow me on LinkedIn, for example, there's a gentleman by the name of Brent Dykes, who's written a really, really good book on data storytelling um, that I've been reading and incorporating its findings into my own um, in my own work. Because as I mentioned earlier, I used to use the term statistically significant. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a good idea a lot of the times. So what I would do is I would recommend reading that book, um, getting that book and reading it. It's great. It provides a lot of hints uh, around, not just around the technical aspects of like what data visualizations are good to use, but also around the psychology of like working with people who are not analytics professionals and how can you communicate with them effectively? So like I said, I wish I had a silver bullet, but I don't. I'm still on the journey myself. Okay, cool, moving on. All right, next up, linear regression. And as per the earlier question, linear regression is no, no better or worse than logistic regression. It's just only second because it's easier to do in Excel out of the box. Okay. So as I said, linear regression is used for predicting numeric outcomes. And what we see here is a screenshot from Excel. This is literally what, um, the analysis tool pack, which is an add-on in Excel, once you turn it on, and if you use it to model your data, this is what gets spits out in one of your worksheets, is all of this stuff. Now, some examples, once again, of what you use linear regression for. You use it to predict things like sales and price and weight, numeric quantities, wildly useful stuff. As I mentioned, it comes out of the box in Excel via the analysis tool pack. It's an add-in. It's both in the Windows and Mac, uh, Macintosh versions. Both of those versions have it, so you can enable it and do exactly what I'm seeing here in both Mac and Windows. Now, here's the thing, as I mentioned earlier. I've highlighted a couple things here in green. Excel handles the math. So when you learn linear regression on this roadmap, you don't learn the underlying mathematics. You're not going to you're not going to have to worry about linear algebra or you know um, probability distributions or anything like that. Realistically, you just need to focus on the concepts. Just focus on the concepts. Like for example, adjusted R square. You don't necessarily need to know unless you're curious. Of course, I would actively encourage you to learn this if you wanted to. But you don't need to learn how it's actually calculated. What you need to know is what it is conceptually and how to interpret the value. That's what's actually important. Excel handles all the math for you behind the scenes. This thing here, the significance of F, look at this, this is a big scary number here, right? 3.535 to E to the negative 29th. If you know anything about math, that's a really, really small number. That's like 0 0.28 zeros and then 3535. <laughs> it's a very, very small number. What you would learn if you studied linear regression is that all this tells you is, what is the likelihood that just using the average is a better model than the one that you just crafted. Because remember I said earlier that the mean, the average is a great predictive model. So one of the things you try to do in linear regression is create a model that's better than the mean. And this statistic just basically tells you how likely is it that you failed that the mean is better. So it's, it's not really complicated. It looks complicated, but it isn't really actually conceptually. So I'm gonna highlight this here. Now, 
just so you just so you're aware, just for some background, this this data that I'm using for this example is from a very famous data set known as the IRIS data set. Um, it's very commonly used in statistics and machine learning, for example. So if I sound like I know anything about the iris flower, I don't. I only know the data set. So just keep that in the back of your mind. But what I wanted to emphasize here is one of these things that you learn when you do linear regression. You can create features to explore interesting ideas, like what is the interaction effect between two things? Now, conceptually, here's maybe a better example than using flower data. Let's say that you work in marketing and you have a hypothesis that the amount of money that you spend on your TV advertising and the money that you spend on your radio advertising is related to your sales. Not an unrealistic hypothesis about the business, but even more importantly, you might think to yourself, if I run TV ads and radio ads at the same time in the same geography, those things are like chocolate and peanut butter. They're better together. That's what's known as an interaction effect. And that's what this thing is showing. You could use this technique, linear regression and interaction effects to model, if I do two things at the same time in the business, are they better together? Are they like chocolate and peanut butter? So this is really, really powerful stuff. It allows you to think about the business, hypothesize what's going on, and then investigate it in a rigorous way. So here's the thing. Here's the reason why you might want to learn linear regression. It is arguably the most widely, used predictive, most widely used predictive modeling technique in the world. As I mentioned earlier, sociologists use it for their experiments and their data analyses. Economists use it. Psychologists use it. And business people use it. And data scientists use it. And analytics people use it. All kinds of people use it. So there must be a reason why it's that popular. And the answer is it's wildly useful stuff. Super, super powerful stuff. Okay. So if we continue on with our example, let's say the, the call center manager has acquired linear regression skills. Now here's what's important. As mighty as the process behavior chart is, it only works with a single piece of data. If you wanna think of it this way, it only works with a single column of data in an Excel table. But what if you want to look at two columns of data or three columns of data or X number of columns of data? Unfortunately, the mighty process behavior chart won't help you. This is where linear regression comes in. Linear regression can handle multiple pieces of data, multiple columns in an Excel table all at the same time. Once again, you could take a look at radio spend, television spend, and the interaction of those two things. You can't do that with a process behavior chart. So if we go back to the call center manager, the call center manager can do things like, what are the critical factors that affect staffing levels? So let's say, for example, I could take a look at day of the week, week of the month, month of the year. Was there a holiday that, um, in this week? Was there a new marketing campaign? Was there a new product launch? Did our website go down? Who knows? All of these factors can be put into a linear regression model. And then the call center manager can then evaluate whether or not any of those things are strongly associated with either a rise or decline in staffing levels. This is wildly powerful stuff if you're a call center manager, because as you might imagine, one of the primary things that you're concerned with is optimizing your staffing level, right? Cost versus customer satisfaction, constant balancing act. Another thing you could take a look at is, could we handle more calls with a different mix of agents? Maybe the call center manager has a hypothesis that if I have more second tier, let's say, tier two folks on the floor, maybe that has a synergistic effect with the number of tier one agents I have on the floor, and maybe I can handle more calls. That's another thing that she can investigate as the manager of the call center. Okay, it looks like we got a couple of questions, uh, a couple of related questions actually. Uh, Kay okay. asks, um, from that example where you had a uh, separable um, versus another variable, is that what you call adding features and modeling? Okay, I'm just gonna pop back right here real okay. quick. So um, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to sound like the cool kids and use some machine learning terminology and don't we all in the end, this is known as feature engineering because this doesn't actually exist in the, in the, in the it's not natural part of the data set, right? The interaction effect is not there. Literally in Excel, what you would do is you would create a new column on your table and I just named it petal length times sepal width and I filled it with literally multiplying the two values, pedal length versus sepal width, all the way down the table. 
So that table, that feature, that column, that piece of data did not exist in the original data set. So that is what's also known as feature engineering. So we've got a, a follow-on question to that. Uh, uh, we ask, how do you determine which features to investigate together for linear regression as the example you just showed here with pedal length versus sepal length? Yeah, okay. So if you were a scientist, you would use scientific theory to help guide the kinds of things that you would use. Like for example, let's say that you were a psychologist, let's say, and you wanted to explore a new aspect of human behavior, you would go look into the literature to see what everyone else had done and then base what you were going to test in your experiment, which would eventually end up in your linear regression model based on previous theory. So that's the scientific world. Uh, in the business world, we typically rely on subject matter experts to help us with our, with our hypotheses. Like for example, um, I know some about marketing, but I'm not a marketing professional. So I might work with like our director of marketing, for example, because she is an expert. And I would say, okay, well, what are the kinds of things that you think we should be investigating? And she might say, for example, um, well, we think that there's synergy between Google display ads and Facebook ads, let's say in digital marketing. So that's might be one of the, the interaction effects that you would put in the linear regression model. Now, since you don't have theory to go off of, as a scientist does, you would talk to a subject matter expert. And that's a real brief explanation. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, cool. Moving on, last part, the citizen business analyst, okay? The creme de la creme, the top of the mountain as it were. Okay, so this is the kind of data visualization I was talking about. Once again, it's that famous Irish data set. <laughs> again, I know nothing about flowers, so please don't think I'm a botanist because that's not true at all. So what this is actually showing is a more advanced visualization. In my experience, these are the kinds of things you don't normally see in Excel workbooks. I'm not saying that they don't exist, but I, in my experience, I just don't see them very often as a consultant or as an employee. So what this is doing is actually taking three columns of data from an Excel table and placing it in one chart, okay? So the first dimension, the x-axis is petal length, right? How long is the petal on the iris flower? And then the second dimension is the width, the y-axis here, right? How thick, how fat is the petal width? And then the third dimension is a category, right? It's this right here. These are three species of iris. I don't, there might be a hundred species of iris. I don't know. There's only three in the data set. <laughs> so there's Setosas, Versicolors, and Virginicas, and they're color-coded. And you can see, not surprisingly, that they're color-coded here. Now, Make no mistake, this is a contrived example for this presentation, okay? But I just want to illustrate a point. Obviously, this is a power, can be a powerful visualization because your eye is automatically drawn to clusters, right? Clusters of things. You can see all the setosas, the blue stuff down here, the versicolors, the orange stuff here, and the virginicas, the gray stuff up here. So clusters can produce powerful business insights. These types of visualizations are extremely useful and they're very, very common. And the reason why they're extremely common is because they are a very, very commonly used data exploration technique in predictive modeling so, or machine learning, for example. For example, if I wanted to create a classification model that allows me to distinguish each type of flower from each other, this, this plot shows me that these two pieces of data, petal length and petal width, do a pretty good job. Because all the blues are totally separated. They're all down here, totally cool. The orange is predominantly separated as well as the gray. And there's a certain amount of overlap, but it's not too terrible. So what this tells me is that there's a lot of going on here in the data. These two particular aspects of the data, petal length and petal width, do a good job of separating out the various categories here, setosas, versicolors, and virginicas. If you're interested at all in predictive modeling or machine learning, this is the kind of thing you do all the time when you're actually trying to do feature engineering, trying to understand what should go in your model and what should not. This is all typically referred to as a data mining type of technique because notice I'm not using necessarily any theory here. I'm literally just going into the data and saying, what patterns can I find? So this is the type of visualization I'm talking about. This is wildly useful stuff. And we'll go through an example once again with the hypothetical call center manager in a couple slides. 
Okay. Logistic regression. Okay. So this, once again, is used for modeling predictive outcomes that are binary. Yes or no, approve or deny, legit or fraudulent. All of these things are, all these types of scenarios, which are very common in the business world, by the way, are the purview of logistic regression. Now, what you can see here is that template that I mentioned earlier, right? Logistic regression does not come out of the box in Excel. But once you learn the, the template here, once you learn the concepts, it's very much plug and chug, right? This is actually a screenshot from one of my own workbooks for a class that I'm building on logistic regression. And this is literally what it looks like. I mean, it's not too difficult. What you would do is you would just, once you learn everything, once you have the template, you literally just copy and paste it into new workbooks and you're off and running. So how logistic regression works is that it predicts essentially a binary, yes or no, that's all it does. And you can see here, in this particular case, this is the cured column, whether or not the person in, in question was actually cured of whatever sickness they had, and whether or not they received the inter, uh, an intervention, like a drug or a pill or some sort of treatment. What happens is once you train this model, this logistic regression model, what comes out is a score from 0, 0.0 to 1.0. And that is interpreted as a percentage. And in this particular case, the percentage of what's the likelihood that they were cured, anywhere from zero to 100%. That's the, what the predictive model puts out. As I said, once again, this is important. It's not out of the box in Excel, but it's actually relatively easily implemented in Excel using the solver. And I'll talk just briefly about the solver if you're not familiar with it. It is a really awesome piece of functionality inside of Excel. It's one of the things you have to turn on. It's not usually enabled by default. Um, it exists in both Macintosh and in Windows. And what it allows you to do is um, what's known as mathematical optimization, right? Essentially it allows you to optimize some sort of problem that you have. In this case, we are asking it to solve the mathematical problem of, hey, can you make the best logistic regression model for me based on my data? And literally once you get the template in place and you fill it out, you just fire up the solver and it's just, it's just a series of clicks. And you click it and what it does is produce these numbers up here for you, which are your model coefficients. And if that doesn't make a lot of sense, it's okay. It's, it's a lot fancier than it sounds in practice. It's not that difficult, really it's not. So here's the thing. As correctly, as correctly pointed out by one of the folks that asked the question earlier, Dave, why did you put logistic regression at the end? Why in linear regression second? Why couldn't they be reversed? It's a legitimate question because logistic regression is one of the most common production models in businesses. Like for example, um, um, they are replete in all kinds of e-commerce types of, of scenarios where you'll have a logistic regression model in production that essentially predicts whether or not a particular customer is likely to convert to paying or not. And as a result of that prediction, maybe the e-commerce site will do something like maybe flash a coupon or pop up a message or open up a chat bot that says, hey, do you need some help? So these things are very, very commonly used in production. The reason why I bring this up is once again, is there's probably a reason for that. It's one of the reasons why you kind of look, at, look around the world and say, look, if everyone's using logistic regression, there's probably a reason for that. So it's probably something useful for me to know. And it absolutely is. It's probably the single most common, it's one of the single most common production models used in industry. Okay, once again, let's go back to this hypothetical call center manager. And we've added the final stage of data literacy. And you can see here the kinds of questions that she can answer as the, as the manager of the call center. So for example, do median call lengths vary by geography? This is that, um, that chart that I mentioned very at the very beginning of the talk. It's called the box and whiskers plot or a box plot. This allows you to have a category along the x-axis and it could be like your Northwest division, your Midwest division and your Northeast division. And then you can have numbers and you can actually say, look, does do my calls vary by parts of the company or country? Or for example, let's say Wojico does business both in the US and Canada. She can look and say, do calls tend to be longer if they come from the US versus coming from Canada or vice versa? These are the kinds of things that she can look at using these data visualization techniques. Or she could look about it like product line. 
you know, does product X tend to have more difficulty with our consumers? So our calls tend to be longer as a result. How about product Y or product Z? And there are any number of factors you can use. This is a really powerful visualization technique. It's a very interesting way to look into your data and see what patterns are going on in the business. Next steps you can also look at, are there discernible patterns of call length versus NSAT, net satisfaction score by agent? If you go back to that, that um, dot chart with, the, with the, the clusters of iris, iris types of flowers that were color coded, imagine if you will, um, there are three agents on the floor. There's Bob and Sally and Frank. And you could create a plot like that where you could have NSAT, let's say, on the X axis and you could have the call length on the Y axis and then you could color code the dots based on whether the call was handled by Bob, Sally or Frank. And maybe, just maybe, you see that Sally is in the lower right quadrant, which means she has high NSAT and simultaneously she has low call lengths. And you might say to yourself, whoa, what's going on here? Looks like Sally's found some secret sauce here. And as the call center manager, you could go to your IVR system, your call system, pull the transcripts, pull the voice recordings of all of Sally's calls and actually listen to them and say, What's Sally doing? Because maybe you found, maybe she has found the secret sauce and you can use that information to devise a new training program to say, look, hey, Bob and Frank, time for you to get with the program here. Do what Sally's doing so that your calls will get in that lower right quadrant as well. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. Now with logistic regression, you can do one of the most interesting things in analytics. In my experience, churn, that is your customers leaving you for a competitor is one of the most um, ripe, low-hanging fruit there is oftentimes in a business. Churn is often something that isn't necessarily paid a lot of attention to, but it's extremely costly. Acquiring customers is very expensive, so you don't want to lose them if you possibly can. So once you learn logistic regression, as a call center manager, you can pull data. And I'm making an assumption here that um, this call center manager has access to like a self-service BI platform where she can pull down data. And she pulls down all the data that she can think of that's related to customer churn. And you know, maybe she samples the data. Uh, maybe Widgetco doesn't have a million customers because Excel is limited to a million rows out of the box. So maybe they have a few hundred thousand customers. She can do that, in, do that in Excel just fine. She pulls down the data, all the factors that are related to churn. And she can use logistic regression to model those to see how, how does each factor affect the probability that a customer is going to churn. And then once she finds those factors that are disproportionately associated with churn, she can then ask herself, what if any of these factors can we in customer service potentially impact? How, how can we help? Hey, we got one question here. Sure. Is, is there a possibility that the features get changed frequently? If yes, how would you design regression to get the most accurate result? Okay, so this is a, um, this is a great question. And I don't, I don't, this, this is not a machine learning talk, so I don't want to get too much into it, but all predictive models get stale. If you operate under the assumption, which I would argue is valid, that the business is never static. There's always, there's always change. New business processes, new products, new marketing campaigns, uh, your competitors are doing stuff. Uh, there's regulatory changes, there's global economic factors, who knows, right? So every predictive model gets stale. So essentially what you need to do is you need to think, um, and I'm ripping off my high school English teacher here, by the way, when I'm, when I'm about ready to say, no model is ever finished, it's only abandoned. Because the business is constantly changing. So you have to go back and you have to go say, look, you know what, those factors that were awesome and were predictive last month, well, maybe, maybe that's too soon of a time frame. Last quarter, let's say. Last quarter, are they still predictive? You have to go revisit them, right? And this is actually what data scientists that work on machine learning models, predictive models, basically as their full-time job, this is what they're constantly doing. Not only are they building new models, but they're actually going back and they're checking the old models to say, look, do they need to be reworked? Because maybe the business has changed and the model doesn't work as well anymore as it used to. And one way to think about that is this is not a bad thing for you. This is job security. Great question, great question. Okay, La lastly, we have, what are the factors under customer services control associated with CSAT? 
this is basically the same idea, right? Now, if you customers, uh, the CSAT stands for customer satisfaction. And what you would do is you would say, even if it's like a numeric score, um, you would change it into a binary. You'd be like, were they satisfied or not? And then you can model that with logistic regression. And you can take a look at the various factors that you pull down from your self-service BI platform, let's say, and then say, okay, of these, once again, what can we in customer service do? So this is powerful stuff, right? I mean, think about all this, all this at once. I mean, this call center manager can do an awful lot of goodness. They can do an awful lot of analyses to op optimize their operations. Uh, to be honest with you, if I was this call center manager and I had all these skills, I probably would just sit behind my desk in Excel like all day, every day, and just like analyze data because <laughs> like, I could do so much. And it would always be a new interesting hypothesis, a new interesting question to explore and then communicate the findings to my leads. And then when it came time for my annual review, I would go to the director and say, cash money time. Okay, look at all the awesomeness that I've done using data. Okay, as promised, okay. Hopefully I've given you the hard sell. Hopefully I've made you super excited about all the things you can do with just a little bit of Excel and a little bit of motivation to learn some stuff. So here are some low cost self-study resources, okay. This will get you to the power user level. These two books alone will get you to business analysis and linear regression using Excel, okay. First up, making sense of data. Now, I'm sure Joe can attest to this because he's followed me on LinkedIn for a while. I talk about this book incessantly on LinkedIn. I, I mention it all the time. If you're only gonna buy one book on data analysis, make sure this is the one, okay? It teaches the fundamentals of business analysis with minimal math, and I mean minimal math. Literally, you just need to be able to add and subtract, multiply, uh, learn a little bit about, um, what the average is, when all, and everyone kind of understands what the average is, versus the median, which is not a complicated concept at all. That's literally all you need to know. This is the definitive work, in my opinion, on the Mighty Process Behavior Chart. And hopefully, as you saw earlier in the deck, you can do a lot of wickedly cool analysis with process behavior charts. And here's the cool thing. This book is self-contained. It makes no tooling assumptions, none at all. What you'll see in here are tables of numbers and charts Everything's self-contained in the book. You can take this with you to the beach. It's all you would need and a highlighter. That's it. Highlight it, highlight it. Dog ear, you should see my copy of the dog ears. It's, it's incredible. This is a great book. Everything, that's, everything that you're seeing in the book can be done in Excel. Now, some more sophisticated tools, like for example, R, can do process behavior charts, but you don't need a fancy tool. You can do them in Excel extremely easily. As you saw in this deck, all of my examples we're all from Excel. They, you can build them in Excel, it's quite easy. So this book is everything you need to achieve that business analysis chevron in the roadmap that I presented earlier. It's all you need, it's a great, great book. Okay, linear regression. Okay, this is a book by Jim Frost. Now, what I want you to notice is this right here, an intuitive guide. This is important. Linear regression is based on a lot of non-trivial math. But his book essentially shows you that that's great. It's cool if you know it. It's good if you know it, but you don't have to know it. For example, as a, once again, social scientists don't necessarily have extensive mathematical training, but they use linear regression all the time in their jobs to analyze the experimental results that they have. So this book is really geared as an intuitive guide. So it's approachable by anybody. What's also a bonus is that it's an ebook. So you can, I do believe... His e-commerce engine does support PayPal. So I'm pretty sure you can pretty much buy it from anywhere in the world if you want. And it's relatively low cost. I believe it's 14 or $15 at the time of this recording US. So it's extremely affordable. And it focuses only on regression. So you get a very targeted read. It's an intuitive guide to using linear regression and only linear regression. This is by far my highest recommendation if this is your first time lear learning linear regression. So if you came to my house, in beautiful Bozeman, Montana, and looked at my bookshelf, you would see books on linear regression. And they range from very technical, lots of math, to books that are not. Like for example, I have a very thick book written by a psychology professor that talks a lot about using statistics with minimal math because his target audience is other psychology students. So they can't, they don't really have a necessarily have a huge mathematical background. This is by far my favorite book out of all of them that I have. So cannot recommend it enough. 
One thing I do need to note is that this book uses a software package called Minitab. Here's the thing, you don't need Minitab. If you have access to Minitab, cool, great, that's awesome, but you don't need it. Basically everything with a couple of exceptions in the book translates into Excel basically out of the box. So you read the book and it teaches you all the concepts that you need to know in a very intuitive way. Uh, you can, everything, almost everything directly translates to Excel. The few things that don't, just get on YouTube, Google, uh, not Google, sorry, get on YouTube, search on YouTube, and you'll find some videos that'll show you how to do all the rest in Excel. No problem, no problem at all. And if you want, if you're interested in this book, you can get it at um, statisticsbygym.com. Dr. Wheeler's book is available from Amazon, of course, not surprisingly. Okay, that's it. If you like what you saw tonight, if you like the content, if you like the way I communicate, um, you can follow me on all these different platforms. I have a YouTube channel, as I mentioned earlier. I'm on LinkedIn incessantly, so feel free to connect with me if you'd like. And you can also go to my website where I have a free analytics tutorial page. And so you can check out a bunch of YouTube videos that I've done on various um, analytics tutorial topics. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending tonight and I wish you very happy data sleuthing. And awesome. I'll open it up to Q&A. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, no um, yeah, so yeah, we have a couple options for Q&A. Um, we can continue using, uh, uh, put your questions in chat, uh, the Q&A box. And like I said, um, I'm tempted to just open up for discussion, uh, kind of like we do at the regular meetups. So um, cool. what do Let's people see. think of this? I'll, uh, I'll have, I have a bunch of questions in the meantime. I've been writing um, for my uh, okay. notepad here. Yeah, so I guess one question is, why, why are you so um, uh, fixated on Excel? I mean, the, the latest ranges right now are Python and R and, um, and other, other uh, languages in data science. Uh, what, what is it about Excel that, that, that keeps your attention? Uh, so, Okay, so I'm going to be completely honest, and I've, and I've posted this up on LinkedIn, so a lot of people in the audience, I'm assuming, have heard me say this before. I come from a coding background. I, was a, I, became, I began my career in tech as a programmer, as a software engineer, and quite frankly, I had a bit of a bias against Excel. I thought it was, you know, Excel, why are you using Excel? Write code, what are you doing? Right? Same kind of thing with Access. What are you, what are you using Access for? That's not a real database. So for a long time, I kind of had this, this, this um, coding elitism against Excel. What's changed my mind is simply this. Um, and I write about this on my, on my website as well as in my profile on LinkedIn. I have come to the conclusion myself that the biggest ROI return for most organizations in the world is not in AI or data science it's actually in raising the data literacy of every employee because so much money is left on the table, in my opinion, in my experience, based on suboptimal business decisions, that that is actually where all of the potential latent ROI exists. Okay, now given that, am I gonna be able to teach the world R? Honestly, at one point in time, that was kind of my goal. <laughs> <laughs> to teach everybody in the world how to do our programming. And eventually I got wise and I realized hey, that ain't gonna happen. But everybody has Excel. Uh, I read a recent article from Harvard Business Review from February of this year that said that, that quoted a statistic that one out of five adults in the, in the world, one out of five adults on the planet, 20% of the entire adult population uses Excel. Uh, Eric Weber, who's a guy on, who's a, a luminary on LinkedIn in the data and analytics space, uses a, a number of 700 million users worldwide. That's why I'm focused on Excel right now. Because um, if you're interested in getting a job as a data scientist at a company like Google, totally cool, I get it. Go, go learn Python, go learn deep learning, go learn all those things, cool, that's, that's great. That's not where I'm at right now. I'm focused on the HR person, the call center manager, the, um, the logistics person, anybody in the business, anybody, any business person, anybody in IT, anybody that's interested in building a base level of data analytics skill, and the easiest way to do that is to use Excel because almost everybody's got it. Almost everybody knows how to use it. So that's why I'm focused on Excel these days. Now, 
I, I'm, I also focus on SQL. I'm also a big SQL fan <laughs> as well. And of course, if you're really interested in doing some more advanced stuff, my, my, um, my favorite language is R. So I'm a Excel, SQL, and R guy. That's what I am. That's cool. I guess, you know, you, you mentioned uh, data science and, and analytics. Like, where do you see the two sort of interplaying and where, where would they be different? Uh... Well, that's... That's, that's a really good question. And that's like an ongoing debate on the various social media platforms, LinkedIn, for example, of what is data science and what is analytics. Um, at one point in time, I, I, was, I was a data science person. I wanted to be a data scientist. I wanted to have that title. I wanted to be recognized as such. I've since changed my mind and gone into analytics. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Um, there tends to be a a perception these days, and it's not universal by any means, but there tends to be a perception that data science equal equal machine learning. That if you're not doing machine learning in some shape or form regularly, like deploying production models, then you're not really doing data science, which is, which is totally cool. That might be a valid way of defining data science, but me personally in my work, that's not what I do. I do everything. I build dashboards, I build reports, I build ETL pipelines. I do predictive modeling, I do it all. So it seems to me that analytics is a more accurate description for the umbrella of skills that I bring to the table and the umbrella of value that I bring to the business. So I would say the difference between the two is really, at least at this point, is essentially like, if you think of it as a pie chart, which is a totally bad data visualization, by the way, if you think of it as a pie chart, is is most of your pie chart doing production machine learning, then people tend to think of that as data science, whereas analytics is everything else. So that's kind of the dividing line I would see is around what, how much machine learning are you actually doing as part of your daily job? And yeah. I, know that's not a, I know that's not a very good answer, but it's, right now I think it's about the best you can, I can come up with. Yeah, it's something I've been struggling with personally. I'm, I'm writing a, a blog post that I think as you uh, said with your teacher, uh, um, something was like undone or, or whatever. Um, but because it, it, it's, it's a moving target, right? It, you know, I, I mean, I mean, my background in, in the early 2000s was uh, doing like a lot of uh, modeling in Excel, partly because that's kind of what you had to use back then um, if you're uh, in business and actuarial stuff. But uh, but you fast forward to today, and, and, and I, don't, I don't think a lot of the analytical practices and analysis has really changed that much from what is what was done 20 years ago. Um, they're just more spreadsheets more data, machine learning is maybe the newest uh, advancement, but with mm -hmm. data science, that's why I say it's a moving target because back in early 2010, data science was very much a machine learning uh, term. And now it's sort of going to encompass uh, analytics and machine learning and other stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, Kimball Hall says, uh, uh, I've run into this. I use Python requests to get data, but everyone in my company would be lost if I didn't give them a spreadsheet. So. Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I used to say, so I used to work at Microsoft um, and I used to work in the SQL Server product team for a while. And even then I would still, and I'd get some dirty looks when I would say this, but I would say that Excel is the world's most popular database engine. It is. I mean, there's a joke, I can't remember who said it, but it was like, uh, you know, when there's a nuclear war, the aftermath is going to be like Excel sheets and like logistic regression. <laughs> <laughs> so. And cockroaches, um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. We even, we even had a term that we call we'd call them spread marts, where you like open up a workbook and there'd be like you know a hundred worksheets and they're like all cross reference with the V lookups and things like. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still looking to companies with that. It's uh, it's eye opening, but yeah, it's but you know, Excel is nice. Uh, it was actually just right, making a presentation for a CEO the other day on this, and it's kind of like Excel's. The, the benefit of Excel is that anyone can get started in it. Uh, I think to your point, I, there's data literacy. I think there's also like just data hygiene that probably needs to be discussed. Like um, if you find yourself having to have like a hundred tab Excel sheet, maybe think about the process because you, you can't get out of that. Um, I mean, it's like a bear trap. The, it's easy to get in and it's like really hard to get out. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I worked, I worked for a property casualty insurer back in the 2000s. And uh, as you mentioned, actuarial modeling and everything they did was essentially in Excel, like VBA, like very complicated stuff. And they, they just couldn't get away from it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, to this day, well, I wouldn't say to this day, but I know back even on Wall Street, like having uh, Excel shops and knowing the, uh, the keyboard shortcuts made you um, really <laughs> valuable. So <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> what other questions does anyone have? Dave and I could just chat here all night. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. Bueller, anybody? Okay, well, <laughs> uh, if you do have any questions, I guess stick around. I'm gonna stop recording on uh, YouTube real quick and uh, just kind of. Let's see here. This isn't so loud.